The noon sun is blazing hot and blisteringly bright. Withering waves of shimmering heat drift upward from the cracked pavement of the trailhead's parking lot, making me not want to leave the cool air conditioning. Jesus, it's only six, the man seated in my passenger seat says. Gonna be a brutal one. Good thing we'll be in there and not out here exposed to this The man points out of the windshield at the thick forest before us. It is like night and day, the difference between the scorching sun above us and the cool light shifting through the trees. I sit and let my car idle, bored already with the work to be done. Did you bring the materials? The man asked. I study the forest, looking for signs of what it truly is, but only see giant firs and thick cedars. If the forest is what it is supposed to be, then it isn't giving away its secret easily. A pair of fingers snap in front of my face. I grab the wrist connected to those fingers and twist. Hey, ow, fuck! The man cries out. I let go and finally give him my attention. You lose those next time you do that, I say. The man nods quickly in agreement. What else is he gonna do? The heat is worse than I expected when I open my car door and step out. It feels like hell itself is facing off against the forest. From what the guy I'm with has told me, that's not far off the mark. You didn't answer me, the man says when he gets out of the car. Did you bring the materials? That's a question you ask before we drive 90 miles into the middle of nowhere, I reply, squinting against the heat and sun. So, did you? He presses. Yes, of course I did, I say. Being prepared is part of my job. Oh, right, the man says. I look over the top of the car at the man. He's in his mid-forties like me, average height and average build like me. He has eyes that have seen shit, which I have as well. But he doesn't have eyes that say he's done shit, not like I have. Rick, I say. Yeah, what? The guy asks. I'm just repeating your name so I don't forget it. I say. Okay, that's not fucking weird or anything. He responds. And I'm a professional medium. I know fucking weird. What's my name? I ask. Fuck if I know. He replies. You never told me. I've just been calling you Benjamin in my head because of all those hundreds you slapped in my hand the other day. Benjamin works just fine. I say. It's better if you don't know my real name. You mentioned that. He says, then mutters. Weirdo. I don't take offense. I'm not normal. I know that. I never have been. My personality and tastes have always been different from others. Even growing up, the other kids knew to steer clear of me. Some would try to engage, thinking they were being friendly and doing the right thing. Can't blame them. Most of humanity are suckers, and for some damn reason, suckers gravitate toward me. I glance at Rick as a case in point. Not that I'm suckering him or think he's a sucker. Not at all. I've paid him to put me on the right path. But while those eyes of his have seen some shit, they have no idea the nightmares that are out there. He has no idea what I've done or who I truly am. Let's get to work, I say. The materials you asked for are in the trunk. I grab my backpack out of the back seat then walk off to study the trailhead. No problem, I'll get them. Rick calls out from behind me. I ignore his tone. For $10,000, I've more than paid for him to lug a box of random shit. Standing close to the forest, I can feel the battle between the heat and cool even more. It's like the forest is draped in cold sheets that drift slowly outward, as if from an unknown source. I say unknown because there definitely is no breeze. The air is still and thick. All right, where should we do this? Rick asks when he joins me, a large produce box in his hands. I turn and stare at him. What? He asks. You're the expert, I say. Yeah, but like I told you, I knew how to get here. I know the ritual and I know what it can do, he says. But I haven't ever personally performed the ritual, and the readings are a little light on specifics on where to perform it. At the trailhead is what you said, I state. He's beginning to annoy me, which is not good for him. This is the trailhead. 
Okay, great. But we're, uh, a little exposed, he says, looking around. He nearly loses his grip on the box and fumbles it, then gives me a weak smile. <laughs> the instructions are to perform the ritual at the trailhead, I repeat. This is the trailhead, so get to work. Rick gives the place another wary look, then turns that wariness on me. I sigh and let my shoulders slump. I read once that type of body language shows acceptance and puts people at ease. When was the last time you saw a car? I ask. Hours ago, he says. Then I think we can risk it, I say, and point at the start of the old trail. Get to work. He looks like he's going to argue, but whatever objection he had planned to say, he sucks back in and shrugs. Then he sets the box down next to the trailhead and lifts the cardboard lid. Two black candles, check. A bundle of posies and lavender flowers, check, he says. I place my hand on his shoulder and he stiffens. Stop that, I say. What? He asks, saying check after each item. I say, I know what's in there. I followed your instructions. Just pull it all out and get it set up. He nods and lifts out each item and sets them to the side. Once the box is empty, he puts that aside and begins to assemble and arrange the items. Most are like the candles and the flowers, just innocuous things that somehow all add up to a potent combination that will get me to where I need to go. There is only one item left to place and Rick hesitates before he picks up the plastic bag. Blood and liquid drip from a tiny hole in the bag and he holds it out away from him. Sheep or goat? He asks, staring through the plastic at the bloody heart the bag contains. Goat, I say. They are more traditional, yes? Yeah, yeah, definitely, he says, and upends the bag so the heart falls directly in the center of the other items. But gravity and physics can be a bitch, and the heart wobbles, then rolls a few inches to the left. It has to be centered, Rick says. Then center it, I say. He hesitates. I shake my head at his weakness and reach down to adjust the heart's position. Once perfectly centered, I straighten up and reach into my pocket. I pull out a lighter and hand it to him. Don't make me keep doing your job, I say. I hope he gets the implication. From the way he snatches the lighter from my fingers and lights the candles quickly, I gather he does get my implication. With the candles lit, Rick picks up the bundle of posies and lavender flowers, closes his eyes, and begins to chant in Latin. I don't speak Latin, so I wait. The chant goes on for several minutes before the candle flames flare into the air, close to three feet high, then die down and go out with a sudden whoosh. Again, there is no breeze, so I have no idea where the whoosh came from. Rick waits a few seconds and takes a step backward. It didn't work, he says. I wait a couple of seconds as I study the forest. I don't feel any change. But that whoosh that killed the candles still has me on edge. How do you know? I ask. There should have been some indication that the trail is open to you, he says. The candles went out, I say. No, no, that's the opposite, he says. That was something trying to stop you. That was a warning, not a completion of the ritual. A warning? I ask. I look deeper into the forest and nod. Like an adversary. Jesus, not like this you don't, he says. And for the first time that day, I hear true sincerity in his voice. He believes that whatever power is in the forest is stronger than me. He could be right. We'll find out. Do it again, I say. Did you bring another heart? He asks. No, I reply. He shakes his head. Then I can't do another ritual. The heart has been fouled. Fouled? I ask. Fouled, he repeats. Any essence of life left in that heart has been used up. So we need another heart. Perhaps yours? I say and look at him. You don't know Latin, he says. Smart guy, good thing to say. But I already know I need Rick for his expertise and not his anatomy. I stand there and wait. We should go, Rick says. We can try again tomorrow or some other day. If I hadn't witnessed the candle's behavior, I would think you are scamming me out of $10,000, I say. 
Oh, that makes him freak out. He goes stiff as a board and his eyes widen to saucers. <laughs> I laugh. He winces. <laughs> but I believe you tried, I say, and lean just a little closer to him. You're going to try harder the second time, right? He nods once and swallows hard. Then, as luck would have it, which for some reason is how I seem to operate and get away with the life I lead, a car pulls into the small parking lot next to mine. Two young women get out. They are busy chatting and laughing and grabbing their gear. They don't see us until they start walking toward the trailhead. Providence, I say and reach into my backpack. I remove the Sig Sauer P226. The young women freeze. I remove a suppressor and the young women turn to run. But I am a professional and this is a tool of my trade. So I have the suppressor on and the pistol aimed before either of them can take more than three steps. A perfectly placed shot to the back of each of their heads. Now we have a backup, I say, and return the pistol to my backpack. Rick has his hands over his mouth and tears are welling up in his eyes. I sigh and do the shoulder slump thing again. Another 10,000 when we get back to town, I say. He slowly looks at me, his hands still covering his mouth. I can't understand you, I say. Don't kill me after this, please, he says. Why would I kill you? I ask. I don't know anyone else who speaks Latin. I nod my chin at the two dead women. Do you want to remove the hearts or should I? He turns and throws up. I'll do it, I say and find my carving knife in my backpack. I unsheath the knife, walk over to the young women and get to work. It's not the first time I've removed a heart. Not even the first time this month. Work has been busy. With a heart in each hand, I walk back to Rick and present them to him. Which one is better? I ask. He doesn't hesitate and points at the one in my left hand. I don't believe he thinks this one is actually the better heart for the ritual. I think he just wanted to pick one and get this done. I don't blame him. Avoiding the previous issue, I pluck the goat heart from its spot and carefully replace it with the heart of one of the young women. Good to go, I say and stand back. Rick nods. While he attempts the ritual a second time, I find the goat heart's plastic bag and wrap up the heart from the other young woman and put it in my backpack. It might be useful along the way. You never know when dealing with shit like this. The candles flare and die down, but they don't go out. Instead, the heart catches flame and turns to ash in the blink of an eye. A roaring wind explodes from the forest and almost knocks me over. Rick curls in on himself and crouches down until the wind stops. It worked that time, he says as he stands up. The trail should take you to where you want to go. Take us, I say as I place my hand on his shoulder. You're coming with, Rick. What? No fucking way, man. He protests and tries to step away from me. My grip tightens, locking him in place. I have no idea what to expect on this trail, I say. And you're the expert. Like I said, man, I'm not an expert, he says. You are more expert than me, I say and pat his shoulder. Then I turn him around and point at the two bodies. Do you really want to be here if a ranger or cop comes by? You aren't going to hide the bodies? He asks. Nope, I say. You'll get caught, he says. Really? You're the only witness, Rick, I say. As far as the authorities know, we arrived well before them, and we were already happily hiking when the women got here. Fuck me, he whispers. <laughs> I laugh. He winces. I turn him back to the trail. We should get going, I say, and walk off. After three seconds, Rick follows. I grin from ear to ear. To say I know nothing of the trail isn't exactly correct. I hired Rick to get me on the right path, but I have been looking for this way for a long time. Three years, eight months, and 14 days to be exact. In my line of work, I see death on almost a daily basis, depending on the job. Sometimes it's quick hit after quick hit. 
Sometimes I have to plan for weeks before I can get the job done properly. Sometimes people annoy me, and I remove those annoyances. Today? Today I wasn't expecting to kill two women, but you take these things day by day. It's the nature of the job. When I first heard of the trail, I was on a job that took special care to be done correctly. The target had double-crossed someone they shouldn't have. That someone hired me to put things right. But as soon as I took the job, the client warned me that the target had certain, well, sensibilities that I needed to be wary of. Before that job, I did not believe in anything I couldn't see or touch. After that job, I believed in everything. How far do we have to walk? I ask Rick after about 40 minutes of hiking. I have no idea, he says from just behind my left shoulder. He's keeping a nice distance from me. He probably thinks he's just out of reach. He can think whatever he wants. Take a guess, I say. Hey, man, you read the same book I did, he says. Shit, you brought it to me, so you tell me what it said. It didn't, I say. It said to walk the trail, and what you are looking for will appear. Then there you go, Rick says. I let the sarcasm pass. He's upset, I get it. We continue hiking. Leon. I whirl around and grab Rick by the throat before he can stop walking. What did you say? I snap at him. He gurgles and chokes as he slaps at my arm. I let go and he gasps for air. I said, then there you go. He wheezes. After that, I bark at him. I didn't say anything. He croaks and looks me directly in the eye. Shit, he's telling the truth. I get the pistol back out and turn in a slow circle. Whoever you are, show yourself. I shout. Leon. I spin around and take aim at where I think the voice is coming from, but there's no one there. The forest isn't dense. Other than the trees and some large ferns, there's barely any foliage for someone to hide in. What are you hearing? Rick asks. Someone's calling my name, I say. My real name. I don't know your real name, Rick responds and points down the trail in the direction we came from. We established that back there, remember? Yeah, I remember, I say. Then I lower the gun and continue hiking. Let's go. Let's go? He asks. Just like that? Something says your real name in a place like this, and you want to keep going? Yes, I say. He takes a little longer this time, but after about five seconds, he follows along. Good, Rick. My senses are on high alert, so I don't miss the movement from behind the tree up ahead. Instead of reacting like a rookie, I act like I see nothing and keep walking. But my hand tightens on my pistol, and I am ready for whatever is fucking with me. Leon. The voice is directly behind me, almost in my ear. But if someone was there, Rick would have told me, or he would at least be freaking out. You all right? I call back over my shoulder. No, he says. How about you? Still hearing someone calling your name? Yeah, I answer. Oh, is all he says. We keep walking. When we pass the tree where I know I saw something, of course, there's nothing there. An hour passes two hours. We are deep into the forest, and the light is dimming more and more as the canopy above us thickens. Then he appears. Hello, Leon, the man says when we come around a bend in the trail. You have made good time. The man is sitting on a large rock and is dressed in a black t-shirt and jeans. His legs are dangling over the side, and he's kicking them about like a kid. He isn't wearing shoes, and his feet are caked in dirt. His toenails are several inches long. He smiles at me, and I want to piss myself, which, if you haven't guessed by now, isn't like me at all. I can't see his face, Rick whispers from my side. I'd almost forgotten he was with me. He isn't wrong. The man's face keeps shifting and changing from different face to different face to different face. I recognize some of the faces from past jobs. What are you? I ask. 
Don't you mean who am I? The man replies. You're a what? I state. He shrugs, but doesn't deny it. I force myself to look him in the eyes, even though the eyes keep changing. We stare at each other for an eternity. Then he breaks first and turns his gaze on Rick. You brought a sacrifice, the man says and jumps down off the rock. Good for you, Leon. Rick's head whips toward me. Don't you even fucking think about it, Rick shouts. We had a deal. You said you wouldn't. I know what I said. I say cutting him off. Calm down. Calm down? He shouts and points at the man moving toward us. The fucking devil calls you by your name and you want me to calm down? Devil? The man laughs. You flatter me, Richard Keller, but you are mistaken. In the blink of an eye, he's right in front of us as if the last few feet of forest between us never existed. Rick cries out, but it's cut short as the man's hand grips his throat. If Rick survives this, he's going to have some serious bruising he'll have to explain to people. I am a lowly demon just looking to make quota, the man says, and leans in close to Rick's face. His tongue darts out and licks the tip of Rick's nose. It's not a normal tongue. He's not a sacrifice, I say. He's my guide. Your guide? The man asks me without taking his attention away from Rick. Are you sure? He was walking behind you. It's called taking point, I say, and reach out and place my hand on the man's arm. Burning pain shoots up my own arm, but I don't flinch. The man tears his attention away from Rick, and I almost smile at the surprise in his many different eyes. But a smile would be considered a taunt, and I haven't figured this guy out. He says he's a lowly demon, but everyone knows demons lie. It's their thing. The pain is excruciating and getting worse, but I refuse to let go. All right, Leon, the man says, and releases Rick's throat. You may have your guide. Rick falls to his ass and brings his knees up to his chest. He slowly rocks back and forth while tears stream down his face. You may let go now, the man says, his many eyes on my hand. I wait a couple of seconds then let go. The pain is a phantom of what it was, but it doesn't fully go away when I break contact with the guy. So Leon, what can I do for you? The man asks as he returns to his place on the rock. I don't see him walk back there. He's just there. I'm looking for someone, I say. Oh, I see, he replies. And you thought this trail would be where you would find this person? This trail leads to the dead, right? I ask. To some of them, yes, the man says. But they have to have been a very specific type of person. He looks me up and down, and it takes all of my willpower not to shiver. He chuckles. Look at you and your self-control, he says. Oh, how I had hoped we'd meet one day. How do I find the person I'm looking for? I ask. Leon is all business, Richard, the man says, looking at Rick. Why are you here, Ricky boy? I'm his guide, Rick manages to say. Smart boy, the man says. Any other answer would mean, well, bad things for Richard. How do I find the person I'm looking for? I ask again. Let me ask you a question or two first, the man says. May I? Will it lead to me finding the person I'm looking for? I respond. Maybe, the man says with a shrug. Maybe not. Then never mind, I say, and start walking once more. Come on, Rick. Oh, calm down, Leon, the man says. I'm playing with you. Have fun with that. I say and continue walking. It takes Rick 15 seconds before he's following me. I'm beginning to have a different opinion of Rick. Another hour passes before the man appears once more. He's busy tending a dead fire, a stick in his hand while he pushes cold ash and charcoal around in the middle of a ring of large rocks. All I want to do is ask a couple of questions, the man says as we get nearer to him. 
One question, I say, still walking. Three, he says. One, I state. We're almost past the dead fire. Two, he counters. One, I repeat. Damn it, Leon! The man shouts and gets to his feet. The fire isn't dead anymore. It roars up high and towers over us. Meet me in the middle here. No, I say and keep walking. Fine, the man yells after we have passed him. One question. I stop, I turn. The fire is dead again. Rick is close by with his back pressed up against a tree. One, I say, and join the man by the dead fire. Shoot. Shooting is what you do. (laughs) <laughs> the man says and chuckles. I don't. I am not amused by the joke. Oh, Leon, lighten up. Ask the fucking question or go the fuck away, I say. All right, but you have to be honest, he says, and wags a finger at me. Or else. I can hear Rick go. The man looks at Rick and laughs. <laughs> See, Ricky gets it. Ask your fucking question, I say. Oh, all right, the man says with a huff. He clears his throat, and the screams of a thousand dying people fill my head. Then it's gone. Okay, Leon, here is my question. Why should I help you? You shouldn't, I answer. Confusion races across his many different eyes. Then a smirk creeps across his face. Oh, that's good. That is very good, he says, and claps his hands as he looks at Rick. Don't you think so, Ricky? Leon didn't try to lie at all. His gaze returns to me. Did you already know the truth was the only way to get your answer? Or did you guess? I'm just an asshole doing my job, I say, just like you. He laughs and laughs and laughs, and all I feel are worms crawling under my skin. Rick begins to sob. The man stops laughing, but his laughter continues to echo through the forest like it has a life of its own. I asked my question, so now I answer yours, he says. The fire comes back to life, but at a normal size. No towering flames this time. He stokes the flames a little, then finally says, To find the person you are looking for, you simply must say their name in the correct spot. Do that, and they will appear instantly. Will they be alive or dead? I ask. Tut tut, the man says. A question for a question. Never mind, I say and start walking again. Dark Lord Leon, the man calls after me. You are an antisocial son of a bitch, aren't you? I don't answer. Three seconds is all it takes for Rick to catch up. Two more hours of hiking and the light above is nearly gone. I pause and turn to Rick. He almost bumps right into me but stops in time. The guy looks like shit. You gonna make it? I ask. Fuck if I know, he says. Did you bring water? I didn't since I wasn't expecting to be dragged along. I pull a water bottle out of my backpack and hand it to him. I was going to save it for the hike back, but Rick looks like he needs it more than me. He takes it and sips carefully. He lets the water fill his mouth before he swallows. Then he hands the bottle back to me and looks around. Is this the spot? He asks. I have no idea, I say. How do we find out? He looks at me, confused. Then he gets it and shakes his head. I already did that ritual back there, he says. Then I came with you against my will. I'm paying you another 10 grand, I say. Well, 10 grand ain't gonna cut it. If I do what I think you want me to do, he snaps. Can you? Can I what? Do what I want you to do. He hesitates. Even with the light almost completely gone, I can see the tension in his jaw. Then I see it spread to his entire body. I wait for him to answer. Finally, he nods so subtly that I almost miss it. Good, I say and take my pack off. What do you need? 
candles and that heart, he says. I know a locator spell. I snort. A few weeks ago, and I would have killed him right there for saying something like that. This is not a few weeks ago. I pull out four black candles and hand them to him. Then I fetch the heart. How'd you know it would be four? He said as he arranged the candles on the forest floor. I hand him the heart and he sets it directly in the center. One for each direction, I say to him. He looks up, surprised. I did some homework. I guess you did, he says, and lights the candle. He speaks more Latin. When he's done, he looks at me and says, Speak the name. I do, and the heart bursts into flames. Then those flames detach, and a small fireball rises into the air and hovers before us. The candles go out as the fireball floats down the trail. We follow. It takes us another hour before the fireball pauses. The sun has completely set, and the only light is from the hovering flames. Is this it? I ask. Rick shrugs. I frown. We don't have any more candles or hearts, Rick. So is this the spot or not? The flames are supposed to lead us to the person you seek, Rick says. That's all I know, man. Before you showed up, I was hustling folks for tens and twenties while I told them their fortune. If they were willing to pay a lot more, then I would contact a relative or someone they loved from beyond. You were wasting your talents, I say. I guess that's a compliment, he replies. But it doesn't change the fact that I'm not an expert in this shit. All I know is what I've read. And what I've read says that when the flames stop, you have located what you seek. And this must be the spot, I say, and set my backpack down. I unzip it and remove the pistol. Hey, what the fuck? Rick cries out. He backs away, his hands up. The light from the fireball reveals the fear and betrayal in his eyes. I shake my head. This isn't for you, I say as I check the pistol and place it back in my backpack. I don't zip it up though. Calm down. Okay, he says, and slowly lowers his hands. The fear is still in his eyes, but the betrayal has been replaced by intense caution. Good for Rick. I turn around in circles a few times to get a sense of the space. I have no idea what's going to happen next, so I want to be prepared. When I stop surveying the area, I take a deep breath, close my eyes, open them and say, Marco Green. I wait, nothing happens. I'm about to open my mouth and call the name again, but Rick holds up a hand and points to a tree that is just outside the fireball's light. I squint into the shadows and can barely make out a form standing there, a human form. Who are you? A man's voice calls out from the dark. It's thick and mucusy. I have something for you, I say and crouch by my backpack. What is it? The man asks. You have to come see, I say and reach into my bag. Then I pull out a small to-go box. What's that? The man says, his voice suddenly filled with hunger. What did you bring me? You have to come and see for yourself, I say. Come closer and take a look. The shadow pauses and then steps closer and closer until he's revealed by the fireball's light. To Rick's credit, he doesn't scream or freak out. It would be a normal reaction when you see a dead man walking toward you. And the guy in front of us is definitely dead. His skin is mottled blue and gray. His eyes bulge from his head and he smells. I open the to-go container and the dead man gasps. Is that? He asks. Then he licks his lips with a thick, dry tongue. I see it catch on his bottom lip and it takes a second before it tears free. The tongue rips off a good-sized strip of blue flesh from the lip as it continues to the corner of his mouth where it gets stuck once more. I watch, fascinated as he struggles and struggles before he finally frees the tongue and sucks it back into his mouth. This, I say, still crouching by my backpack as I hold up the open container, is a chocolate chip cannoli from Bricotti's Deli. Oh, he says, and his dead body shivers in anticipation. 
You brought that... for me? I brought it for you, I said. I stretched my arms and moved the container closer to him. Go ahead, Marco. Take the cannoli. I shouldn't, he says. Why not? I ask. I am trying to. He says, then pauses before he continues. My wife wants me to lose weight. Does she? I ask and look around. I don't see your wife here. Do you, Marco? I'm not surprised by this. Everything I read said the dead come back confused. Confusion always works in my favor. You're hungry, right, Marco? I ask. I think so, he says. Then take the cannoli, I say and fully extend my arms. It's your favorite. He hesitates, but even in death, his urges control him. He snatches the container out of my hands and begins devouring the cannoli. Now, I stand, pistol in my hand. Do you know who I am? I ask Marco. He shakes his head no as he finishes off the cannoli. Then he starts licking his fingers with that awful tongue. When he's done, he stares into the container and then looks back at me. Do you have more? He asks. No, but I do have a message for you. I say and raise the pistol. He stares at the pistol, confused. Mr. Albertini told you that even death wouldn't stop him from getting to you, I say, and fire twice between Marco's dead eyes. Black brains and gray bone explode out the back of his head. The dead man collapses in a heap. I put two more into his head and then two in his chest, because who the fuck knows how many rounds it takes to keep a dead man down. The fireball disappears and darkness envelops us. But I don't need light. I can make out the body at my feet just fine. Years of practice. I stand there over the double dead corpse and wait, and wait, and wait. Finally, Rick says, I don't think he's getting up. Good, I say and turn to him. Then the job is done. Time to head back to the car. That's it? Rick asks. The job is done? Time to head back to the car? Yeah, I say. Was there something else you needed to do out here? I can just barely make him out in the dark as he shakes his head back and forth. Leon, 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 a voice says from the darkness. That was a mistake. Now you'll have. I lift the pistol and fire the remaining rounds in the direction of the voice. I hear the rounds hit their mark, then a thud. Well, fuck me, the demon whispers just before he burst into flames. But the flames don't rise into the air. They are sucked into the earth and are gone in seconds. Did you just fucking kill a demon? Rick asks. Yeah, I say. I'll have to charge Mr. Albertini extra for that. I pick up my backpack switch out the pistol spent mag for a fresh one, stow the pistol, then pull out two headlamps. I toss one to Rick. He actually catches it. Let's get out of here, I say and start walking. After a couple of minutes, I ask Rick, what are you doing next Thursday? I don't fucking know, he replies as we make our way back down the trail. I just want to still be alive, if you get what I'm saying. No problem, I say. I could use your help is all. Are you fucking kidding me? He laughs. <laughs> There's 30 grand in it for you, I say. He stops laughing. Oh, he says. So? I ask. Um, yeah, I think I'm available on Thursday. He answers. Good, I say. Wear something you don't mind getting dirty. I hear him swallow hard and I grin from ear to ear as we hike. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy these stories, be sure to subscribe to the podcast and check out some more of my episodes here.